The accident at Chernobyl NPP Unit 4 destroyed the reactor core and significant part of the technical equipment and building constructions of the Unit 4. At the same time, barriers and safety systems prevented distribution of radionuclides contained in irradiated nuclear fuel were destroyed. After the first meeting of the Governmental Commission, the question arose about the long-term preservation of Unit 4 by constructing of a structure which would prevent release of radioactive substances of ionizing radiation outside the destroyed power unit. Now we cannot see the shelter object in the original. You know that at the end of 2016, in November, the new safe confinement in form of arch was installed in the design position over the shelter object. Therefore, now all the information can be provided only on the basis of the mock-up installed at the observation pavilion. Construction was started immediately after the accident in 1986. Real physical work on the shelter construction at the site of the destroyed Unit 4 started already in May. It was necessary as soon as possible to provide a barrier on the way of very powerful radioactive releases, especially intensive within the first 10 days after the accident. The governmental commission decided to start dropping from the helicopter materials intended to localize the sources of releases into the reactor shaft. During the first day, 45 flights were performed on April the 28th Pilot helicopter 90 times flew to the Unit 4 and by May the 1st the number of flights was increased in 15 times. This facility was built as a localizing encasement for hundreds and hundreds tons of fuel containing materials formed as a result of the explosion of the Chernobyl Unit 4. The construction of the facility continued six months. Already in November of 1986 the facility was completed. These were the days, weeks and months of very hard daily walk of thousand and thousand persons, walk associated with the daily risk to health, risk to people's lives. You can imagine that more than 90,000 persons were involved in construction of the facility during the first two post-accidental years. Of course, the plant's operational personnel Plants walkers, fire guard, were the first at place of explosion. Namely, these people accepted the heaviest impact of radiation. They were involved in the very first, most dose-related walks on elimination of the accidental accident consequences. These people were well aware of the risks and hazards. These people performed the assigned to them tasks, and these tasks were fulfilled. The main tasks after the accident were the following. To stop the self-sustaining reaction, localize the fire which overtook the premises of the destroyed unit, to minimize radiation releases, to cool down the fuel-containing masses and to prevent them from moving downwards to the sub-reactor premises. All actions carried out at the site were aimed to perform these tasks. In general, it was necessary to take the situation under control. To construct the shelter object, people walked in very severe radiation conditions, in the immediate vicinity to the destroyed unit where the gamma radiation level reached 500 rangens per hour. Directly near the destroyed reactor, radiation levels reached 5000 ringgains per hour. People walked only minutes and during those minutes they received annual radiation doses. Of course, the personal rotation was permanent. The most difficult task was to build a roof above the shelter object, so-called light roof. First of all, B1 and B2 support beams were laid. It was visually identified 
the unit structures were not destroyed, but it was not expedient to speak about long-term stability. In particular, I'm talking about ventilation shafts on which the roof support beams were laid. In the western end, these beams were laid on the western wall. That perhaps was the most difficult part in the light roof construction. And pipe covering was laid on these beams, that is 27 pipes of rather large diameter. They were laid on the Lord bearing roof beams. Initially it was decided to concrete the roof, but then this decision had to be rejected since there was a threat of its collapse. It was necessary to create a structure which should be lightweight and durable at the same time. The solution was found, steel sheets laid on a pipe covering. Northern zone structures, northern hockey stick shields and southern zone structures. The frame with the weight about 1000 tons are also supported by these supporting beams. The northern zone of the object, now this is the cascade wall, is famous for the fact that radioactive garbage, fragments of destroyed structures were bulldozed here. All that was poured by concrete, buttress were created and on them, some 12 meter steps, the sarcophagal builders moved closer to the destroyed reactor. Further, a small buttress was created, the northern hockey stick shields were installed on the roof supporting beams, which in turn were supported by a small buttress. Here on the mock-up you can see the cross section of the northern zone. This is the cascade wall, we talked about it earlier. The levels of gamma radiation after the accident in this zone reached up to 2000 rain gains per hour. Three batching plants were built in the immediate vicinity to the site. These plants supplied concrete for construction. It was pumped inside the object completely filling the premises, in particular the northern main circulation pumps premise. You can see that is completely concreted. This is RBMK, high power channel type reactor. We can see the reactor core, which was completely destroyed at the moment of explosion. Before the accident, the reactor was loaded completely. It contained 2000 tons of uranium. At the moment of explosion, part of the fuel was thrown out of the facility. The upper cover of the reactor construction, which design position is horizontal, was lifted during explosion to a height of about 30 meters. After destroying the roof, it dropped down and placed almost vertically, slightly downward to the reactor shaft. The weight of this construction, which is known as Scheme E or Scheme Yelena, is more than 2000 tons. Based on that, we can assume what was the explosive force. As a result of it, part of the fuel was thrown out of the facility and the West Territory from the Chernobyl site itself and further through the territory of Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, Eastern and Western Europe. In total, this is more than 200,000 square kilometers. More than 30 years have passed since the accident, but the risks from the destroyed reactor are still present. The main danger is the presence of a huge quantity of fuel-containing materials formed as a result of the explosion. Temperatures at the moment of the accident reached colossal values, about 2000 Celsius degrees. On May the 6th, the bottom slab of the reactor was burned up and the melting masses began their movement downwards into the under-reactor premises. These float down lava flows are shown here on the mock-up. During this period of the accident consequences elimination, the main task was to stop these lava flows since there was a risk that melted fuel containing masses could melt the foundation slab and penetrate into soils and groundwater. It was decided to build so-called traps for fuel containing masses to construct an additional cooling horizon. Constructively, this was a reinforced concrete slab which has to be constructed under the foundation of the Unit 4. Before to start construction, it was necessary to deliver all materials inside. Therefore, initially a tunnel was built under the Unit 4 building at a depth of 12 meters. Miners from Ukraine, 
young, 20-30 year old guys not protected adec adequately from ionizing radiation, in some cases due to lack of personal protective equipment, took part in construction of this tunnel. And on the foundation slab, additional cooling horizon was built. Pipes of very large diameter were installed directly in the body of this slab. It was assumed that cold water would be pumped through them to cool down the fuel-containing masses, but this facility wasn't commissioned since the fuel-containing masses spontaneously stopped in the under-reactor premises, and at the moment we have 1,300 of so-called FCM in the under-reactor space of the Unit 4. Fuel-containing materials are nuclear fuel damaged as a result of beyond design accident independently of its physical and chemical state. These are the fuel assemblies currently located inside of the southern cooling pool. This is thin dispersed radioactive dust. These are fragments of the reactor core. These are various alloys and melts, various chemical compounds, lava-like fuel containing masses. These are all materials containing nuclear fuel in a volume equal to or exceeding 1%, plus radioactive waste, thousands and thousands of cubic meters of liquid and solid radioactive waste. 33,000 cubic meters is only high-level waste and all these materials require permanent monitoring and control of their state and behavior. Among the tasks solved after the accident, first priority task was to stop the further development of the chain reaction, to localize the fire within the damaged premises of the first unit, to minimize radioactive releases, to cool down nuclear fuel and fuel containing masses. And for the purpose, a huge amount of various materials were thrown inside the facility from helicopters, sand, clay, lead, dolomite and so on. And here, on the mock-up, you can see these materials that didn't drop directly into the damaged reactor, plus, of course, the ruined constructions of the central hall itself. Here we see the drum separators, which provided water and heat removal for the turbine hall. What follows is the part of the reloading machine, only its remaining part. The total weight of this reloading machine is 460 tons. This allows to imagine the force of explosion occurred at Chernobyl NPP Unit 4. Here on the mock-up we also can see a part of the main circulation pumps. In total, during the reactor operation there were 8 pumps, usually 6 pumps are in operation and 2 are in standby mode. Here we see the northern parts of the main circulation pumps and the south side. Here we see drum separators. These huge machines pump through the large volume of circulating water coming from the main circulation pumps. By the way, the main circulation pump pours 8000 cubic meters of water per hour and delivers this water to the drum separators. Further, we see the reactor itself and its core. Here are two diagnostic buoys in which equipment is located to measure radiation levels as well as other parameters necessary to know the situation inside the destroyed unit. Here we see the central or reactor hall premises with collapsed structures. We see the remains of those materials that were dropped from the helicopters at the time of extinguishment here in central hall as well as the premises where the drum separator are located. This is a mammoth beam performing the support functions for the shelter object construction. Here we can see installed dust suppression system intended for suppression of the dust accumulated in the central hall premises. Nextly we see a fragment of the Unit 4 control panel from where the Unit 4 was operated and controlled. It is located on the south side of the Unit 4 building. Also on the mock-up we see the declined walls and this is not the error of the building designer or this mock-up manufacturers. As a result of an accident, these walls were displaced and part of the premises was filled with the concrete in order to reinforce those walls and to avoid possible collapse. We also see a fragment of a sleeper support installed here within the premises of the Unit 4 and preventing the collapse of the deaerator stack panels and walls. 
at the mock-up we also see a ventilation stack having a high of 150 meters at the top point. This pipe was operated for ventilation of the Uni 3 and 4 until 2013. After that, it was dismantled and instead of it a new pipe was built, which is located in the area of the de stack.